Hello everyone. Today for this video, we're going to look at some of the ways in which you can approach studying anatomy and at the different levels of organization. And we'll also go over a very brief overview of the body systems and their general function. To understand or describe the human body and its systems, we're going to break it down into parts and then into smaller parts. And there's a few different approaches here we could take. When we study the big visible parts, and systems. This is called gross anatomy. And there's two major ways of doing this that are referred to as a regional or a systemic approach. The regional approach takes a section of the body, such as the head, the neck, the torso, the arm, the abdominal region, and they examine everything in it. So if you're looking to operate on the neck to say remove the thyroid gland, you'll want to know the landmarks to find it and to avoid damaging muscles, blood vessels, nerves, and so on. So this approach is well suited to a more clinical approach like medical school. So any region of the body is going to contain at least skin, muscle, bone, blood vessel, nerves, whereas other systems like the digestive, urinary, reproductive are more localized. In this class, we're going to take the systemic approach. That is, we're going to isolate the different systems of the body and examine each one body-wide. This is really the simplest approach, especially when you are just learning it. And I'm going to go over the brief overview of those systems in a minute. But as we go over the individual systems, always keep in mind the interaction and interdependence of these systems, and that in reality, looking at any actual human body or cadaver can get quite messy. And there's another subfield of gross anatomy. That's referred to as surface anatomy. That is looking at how superficial or surface anatomical markings relate to deeper anatomical structures. And this is useful knowledge in most healthcare fields. And it's also useful as we study the systems to relate whatever you can to your own body. So if you have Martini's text, chapter 12 has some useful figures in this regard. So that's gross anatomy, stuff you could see with the naked eye. And then the other major field of anatomy is looking at body parts using some sort of microscope. Microscopic anatomy is subdivided into two specialties, cytology and histology. The word cyte will always refer to cell, and cytology looks at individual cells, their shapes, and their organelles. In this class, we're not going to do too much cytology, and when we do, it's typically from illustrations rather than real-life samples. What we do do quite a bit of is look at groups of specialized cells and their cell products that work together to perform specialized function. This is the study of tissues, which is referred to as histology. Every lab practical that you'll take will be devoted to some degree to be able to identify specific tissues and subtypes of tissues, as well as the components of a tissue. So we're going to get back to that in the next lecture extensively. And by the way, I'm going to take a second to note that sometimes on my slides there may be a lot of words and labeling that you could barely see. You can usually ignore that if it's present and focus on either the large print or the highlighted text. So that is macro or gross anatomy and microscopic anatomy. And I also want to mention two more fields here that come up frequently, although I don't typically test on these. So one of them is developmental anatomy, and it's useful to look at embryonic structures to understand adult structures because they're much simpler. For example, this is a close-up of a cross-section of an adult arm that has bones and muscle, and there's a lot going on even without the blood vessels and nerves showing. And here's a picture of an early embryo with the limb bud growing out and it actually gives you a clear idea of the overall structure of that limb. Those red dots in the middle are cells that will become bone. The green cells around them will become the connective tissue fascia and the tendons and the purple cells around them will be the muscle. So this is a very simplest way to look at the organization of the arm and that goes for many of the systems we'll study. It also helps you make sense of how it's possible to get the organizational complexity of these interacting organs, which, along with blood vessels and nerves, 
are connected and intertwined and interdependent in such a complicated way. These are all just growing out together at the same time from a much simpler organization. So the other field is called comparative anatomy. And I can also use this similar to the embryonic or developmental anatomy to look at a simpler system that's easier to understand. Additionally, it's often useful to see and compare organs that have become adopted to different environments to illustrate their functions. So those are the fields of anatomy and the specialties within. Next, I want to talk about another broad theme in anatomy, and that is the levels of organization. Your body can be broken down into systems, and within that system, you'll have organs and making up the organ. You're going to have tissues and structures. And within the tissues, you're going to have cells, cell products. And within the cells, you're going to have parts of a cell and so on. This breaking down into smaller and smaller parts mean is what I mean when we're talking about the structural levels of organization. So the study of biology usually starts at the molecular or chemical level, move up to things like proteins, then on to the organelle level like the cell membrane and other parts of the cell, before moving on to that basic unit of life, the cell. For this class, we only get down to the protein level a few times. We look deep into the muscle cell at the protein level, for example. And we do talk about individual cells, but you, the majority of that is talking about individual cells within groups of cells and their cell products, which is what is referred to as a tissue. That is the domain of histology, which we'll be covering in the next lecture. So different tissues are going to make up the next level of organization, the organ. And you know things like the heart, the liver, the brain, the stomach, these are all obvious organs. They're pretty distinct and they perform a pretty specific function. However, an individual muscle like your biceps brachii, an individual bone like your femur, named blood vessels like your jugular vein, each of your named ver nerves like your vagus nerve, these are all considered individual organs. You can see here from these definitions you can get the general picture. An organ consists of two or more different tissue types organized to serve a larger function. Sometimes it can get a little confusing. For instance, in the digestive system, there's obvious discrete structures like the gallbladder, the pancreas. Uh, but the digestive tract itself is one continuous tube with different specialized regions. So these, you may see these referred to as regions or subdivisions or organs. I'm not going to nitpick on any of these as to their classification. Then, on any given organ, there's going to be distinct regions, features, structures, layers, openings, etc., etc., that you'd have to identify or explain. For instance, here are two organs, the humerus and the ulna bones. And on those bones, you have very distinct features that play an important role in their function. And any other major concept is that many organs or regions, and really your whole body is composed of and organized by layers of different tissues. So identifying those layers with any different part of the body is a big part of the class. So those are organs and parts of organs, and individual organs work together to perform a specific need of the body. And this is referred to as an organ system. And we're going to be studying 11 organ systems that work together and make up the organism. So for everything that we're going to study, always try to keep in mind this levels of organization. If you remember the example of a car, it was made of systems, the drivetrain, the cooling system, the steering system, all geared toward the function of keeping the car running and providing some level of ease and comfort for the driver and passenger. And that those systems are composed of several parts, and the parts were made out of a particular material, metal, glass, rubber, that was appropriate for its function. The systems that we're going to study for the human body will all, with one exception, have the ultimate purpose of keeping you alive. And like any other living organism, we are made of cells, trillions of specialized cells and cell products. So what any single cell organism, like an amoeba, 
has to do to survive, every single cell in your body has to also do to some extent. So there are shared characteristics of any life form, and these characteristics can be displayed or carried out by a single cell, or a group of cells, or an organ, or a system. But whether it's a single cell, or a multicellular animal such as ourselves, all these common characteristics of life are intertwined with each other in order to survive and maybe reproduce. So in order to do this, an organism must be able to respond, that is usually move, either the whole body or parts within their body in response to changes in the environment. In the case of a single cell, it may be because some receptor within a cell membrane has been stimulated, which causes some sort of change in its behavior. For you and I, our nervous system detects environmental stimuli and directs the body or parts of the body to respond to it in some way. The nervous system is very fast and can be very local, whereas the endocrine system, which also responds to certain stimuli, acts a little slower, it's less specific, and the actions are usually much longer in duration. Another characteristic is not necessarily carried out by any one system, but rather as characteristics of the whole body and cells within the body, that is growth and differentiation. But what I want to talk about here is the concept that cells differentiate to perform specialized functions. Actual cells, remember, are not just blobs with organelles in them. They have very unique shapes and proteins to carry out very specific functions. However, all those specialized cells come from a single fertilized egg, which then divides and divides and divides, becomes more and more cells, and magically become different from each other during development. So here in this image, it kind of illustrates what I'm talking about, not in your body during development, but something along the lines of what may have happened during the evolution from a single cell to a multicellular organism. A single cell the unicellular proteus here can do everything it needs to survive and reproduce all on its own. And at some point during evolution, some of these single cells formed a colony that are more tied together and start to function as a single unit. And then at some point during their evolution, some of these cells become specialized for movement and maybe lose some of the ability to directly digest their own food in the process. So these cells depend on another group of cells that are specialized for synthesizing food, but themselves cannot move very well on their own. So the point here is that those specialized cells are kind of like what we see in the different tissues of our body. But I want you to always keep in mind that they all need what any living cell still needs to survive, oxygen and nutrients. And the same is true for every single cell in your body. And systems like the respiratory, digestive, cardiovascular are devoted to keep all the cells of your body alive. Okay, so all the cells in your body exist because of cell division during your development. But as far as systems go, the creation of a new organism is carried out by, duh, the reproductive system. And then unlike any other system in the body, this does not help you survive as an individual, rather it is to allow the continuation of the species. And this is also the only system where we talk about the male and female systems separately. All the other systems are pretty much the same in both sexes. The next characteristic is movement. And this is a really big one because you could think of movement in a bunch of different ways. When you move your whole body, this is the domain of the skeletomuscular system. Inside your body, whole organs, like your heart, move, and things, and fluid, and air, move through tubes and tracts. And this is one of the functions of your digestive, your cardiovascular, your lymphatic, and respiratory systems. Another form of movement is molecules moving in and out of the cells which make up your body. This is the domain of the respiratory system, which exchanges gas with the environment, and your circulatory system, which delivers oxygen and nutrients to all the cells in your body, and also carries away waste. Also, every single cell in your body is also participating in this kind of movement. And I'm going to also add the integumentary system, that is the skin, 
under the movement category. In this case, your skin is preventing movement of things that we don't want in our body and preventing movement of things out of the body that we want to keep in. So this movement in and out of cells is all in the name of metabolism and excretion. Metabolic processes like making ATP to do the cellular work needed for cell function and survival and ultimately our survival. The respiratory and digestive system are bringing in the oxygen and nutrients respectively and also along with the urinary system involved in ridding the body of its waste product. So over the length of the course we're going to examine the skeletal system that's going to allow us to stand against gravity and in conjunction with the muscular system allow us to move around. The nervous system is going to allow us to move in a purposeful and coordinated manner along with many other functions. To do all that requires a lot of energy and creates waste so these systems need blood circulation. Oxygenated blood requires a respiratory system to obtain oxygen and that blood needs to be actively pumped into the lungs and then once oxygenated pumped throughout the whole body. The blood is also carrying nutrients that every cell in the body needs and carries waste away from those cells. That requires a digestive system to break down food into its constitutive elements and waste removal is accomplished by gas exchange in the lungs and then other metabolic wastes are processed and excreted out through the urinary system. And lastly, the system that carries out our biological imperative, the reproductive system. So that's it. That covers the fields of anatomy, gross and microscopic, the levels of organization for all our systems and an overview of the body systems. Next time we're going to talk about the general body plan. See you then.